Hello everyone and welcome back to another lecture on literary theory. As you know, we had ended our previous lecture on Longinus's theory of sublime by noting how similarities may be drawn between uh, the notion of sublime and the romantic movement. Uh, but before we move on to discuss the romantic movement of the late 18th and early 19th century, we will have to dwell upon the story of the preceding hundred years. Uh, this is because it was during these hundred years, so I am talking roughly about uh, the period from late uh, 17th century to late 18th century. Uh, these were the years that saw the emergence of an attempt to theorize literature within the field of English literary studies. Now, uh, this statement might uh, sound controversial, so let me elaborate. Uh, it was during uh, the period between late 17th and 18th century that English literature gradually became a subject of critical interest and scholarly discussion. Now, it is important to note here that English literary studies as an institutionalized academic discipline would not be established till the 19th century. Uh, the late 17th and 18th century emergence of English literary studies was not connected with academic institutions, but rather with what is known as the growth of the public sphere in Britain. So here I am making a distinction between the emergence of English literary studies and the emergence of English literary studies as an academic discipline. As an academic discipline, it will emerge only during the 19th century, but as a field of debate and discussion, it gradually emerged during this period from late 17th to 18th century. So it is within this public sphere that English literature first started being discussed in a comprehensive and coherent manner. The development of literary theory vis-a-vis -vis English literary studies was at the heart of this 18th century enterprise to engage with literature in general and English literature in particular in a systematic manner. In today's lecture, we will discuss how the emergence of a public sphere in Britain gave rise to English literary studies as a new field of discourse. We will also discuss how this in turn was connected with the development of the first set of critical theories that was inherently connected to English literary studies. A set of theories that are today identified by the name neoclassical literary theory. But I want to open this discussion by looking at the term literature itself. Uh, and here I would like to reiterate some of the things that I have already mentioned in my first lecture in this series. Uh, literature, which uh, has its roots in uh, the Latin word litera, was associated in English till the 16th century with the notion of literacy, uh, which is uh, simply the ability to read. Ever since Caxton, established the first printing press in Britain in the 15th century and uh, printed books started becoming more and more available, uh, the ability to read printed material became one of the prominent signs of literacy. So the literacy that was signified by the term literature now after the establishment of the printing press in Britain started to mean the ability to read printed material, the ability to read printed books. And literature, even today, retains this strong link to the ability to read printed books. Indeed, this is precisely why oral forms of literature are regarded as a kind of special or even marginal category within the field of literature. Furthermore, in an age where uh, drives to achieve mass literacy was unheard of, the ability to read was a sign of accomplishment that could only be achieved by a leisured class. 
uh, a leisure class who would undergo a fairly prolonged training in order to achieve literacy. So this kind of time uh, was not available to everyone in the society. The ability to read, uh, which signified uh, having literature in oneself, also had a limited class basis, a limited class base, because reading material, including uh, printed books, was only available to a very few. They were enormously expensive uh, compared to uh, the prices uh, that they have today. And at that point of time, they were available only to a very few group of people within the society. So, literature ability to read printed books was something, was a practice that was fairly limited uh, to a very small social class. Thus, by the 18th century, literature was firmly connected to the idea of social distinction. To, uh, it was a mark of belonging to that small social group, a privileged social group. Uh, literature at least in the sense in which it was associated with literacy and printed books, was an activity that was far removed from the peasants' world of back-breaking manual labor. Uh, acquaintance with literature was therefore a sign of belonging to the upper echelons of a class-bound society. But the question is, uh, who constituted this upper echelon of society? In the Britain of 17th and 18th century, the answer to this question was actually fast changing. Because in the 1640s, England had experienced a bloody civil war, which had culminated in the beheading of King Charles I and the establishment of a republican state. This led a severe blow to the existing power structure of the society, in which the long entrenched aristocrats headed by an absolutist monarch, held complete sway over the affairs of the state. The bourgeoisie, as a distinct class, was making their presence felt on the political arena through trying to establish the primacy of the parliament over the arbitrary diktats of the monarchs. And the establishment of a republic in 1649 significantly tilted the scales towards their favour. These gains of the civil war were retained by the bourgeois and even further enhanced through the glorious revolution in 1688, another major event in 17th century British history. And 1688, uh, though it saw the return uh, of the monarchical form of government, this uh, return to monarchy was uh, significantly different from the kind of monarchy that Britain had known till before the Civil War. William and Mary, who were made the new monarchs of Britain following the Glorious Revolution, were also administered a coronation oath in which they had to swear that they would govern according to the statutes and laws that have already been discussed and agreed upon in the Parliament. Therefore, the new centre of power no longer remained the court of an autocrat, where the voice of one man reigned supreme over all other voices. Now, the site of true power became the parliament, where the members conversed as equals and not as subordinates. Uh, this spirit of holding a discussion amongst equals which informed and indeed still informs the idea of a parliament, uh, was replicated in the 18th century more locally by such informal gathering places like clubs, coffee houses and chocolate houses. And these were the places which formed what is known as the bourgeois public sphere in Britain. And it is in this broader story of the rise of the bourgeois politics and bourgeois public sphere that we can locate the emergence of English literary studies and its quest to develop a coherent theoretical discourse about literature.
Here, however, I need to clarify something. In uh, British literary history, every major socio-political change has resulted in the creation or adaptation of some new kind of literature or the other. Uh, for instance, the Norman conquest of England in 1066 resulted in a great uh, social as well as political shake-up of the country. And as a direct result of it, we see the emergence of the metrical romances, which occupies such a crucial place in medieval literary history of Britain. Uh, similarly, the rise of the bourgeoisie in Britain during the 17th and 18th century also brought with it a new form of literature. And this new form was the novel. But my focus in this lecture is not the rise of this new bourgeois form of literature, but rather the rise of a new bourgeois form of looking at literature in general, of studying it, of studying literature, and of talking about literature. What is unique and unprecedented here is therefore not the development of a new literary genre like the novel, but rather the development of a shared parameter for critically judging literature as an art form within the general field of English literary studies. In the rest of the lecture, I will talk about two very important things. First, I am going to talk about the idea of public sphere. Uh, what it means and what was the kind of public sphere that we see developing in Britain during the 17th and 18th century. And the second thing that I am going to talk about is a kind of literary theory that this British public sphere gave rise to and why this particular kind of literary theory is today known by the name of neoclassical literary theory. Uh, so to begin with the idea of the public sphere. Now, this is a term that is most strongly associated with the work of the German intellectual Jürgen Habermas, uh, who in his book titled the structural, and I am sort of referring to the translated English title of the book, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, which was originally published in 1962, the German version. Habermas in that book describes public sphere as constituted by social institutions which provide a platform for debates and discussions through which public opinion is shaped. So, according to Habermas, public sphere is constituted by different kinds of social institutions which provide platforms for debates and discussions through which public opinion can be formed public opinion can be shaped. And if we look around us, we can see numerous instances of such platforms of open public debates and discussions, ranging from uh, village squares to television studios. Now, I think you will realize that these social institutions become especially uh, relevant within a democratic political structure because it is precisely in such a political system that public opinion gets shaped through open debates and these open debates uh, then shape the function of the government, the shape of the government. So within the political system of a democratic country, these platforms of open public debate which constitute the public sphere becomes very relevant and very important. And in the western world, the public sphere became more and more important as feudalism gave way to more democratic structures of governance. And for Britain more specifically, the social institutions constituting a public sphere of debate, discussion and opinion making became significant from the late 17th century onwards following the beheading of the absolutist king Charles I and subsequently through the uh, assertion of the parliament's supremacy. Now, this public sphere which in Britain came to prominence during uh, the late 17th, 18th century had two very strong influences. The first was the influence of enlightenment 
and the second influence was that of capitalism. Now, enlightenment, which uh, swept through Western Europe during the 17th and uh, 18th century, prioritized reason, prioritized rationality, and it foregrounded the ability of human reasoning to make sense of the world around us. God or the faith in divine authority was no longer called upon to explain human existence or the universal order which framed that existence. And this privileging of the rational, this privileging of reason, the faculty of reasoning formed a key aspect of the late 17th and 18th century public sphere as well. Um, if we consider the court of a monarch, we will see that it is the voice of one person which has absolute sway over all other voices. And the reason why this single voice has an absolute sway over all other voices is because the voice of the monarch is considered to be divinely guided. And this is at the heart of feudalism. Uh, the monarch does not need to convince others through reasoning. His words are taken for granted simply because he is the monarch and is situated at the top of a hierarchical social and political pyramid, where unquestioning obedience is the norm. If you compare this to the public sphere informed by the values of uh, enlightenment, you will see that public opinion is shaped by people who appeals to the reasoning faculty of their fellow participants. So unlike the court, the members of uh, the public sphere are perceived by each other as equals and the argument or opinion of one member can only trump the argument and opinion of another member if they are perceived as more rational if they appeal to the reasoning faculty more. This uh, privileging of rationality, like uh, all the other forms of discourse emerging from within uh, this public sphere, also influenced the discourse of neoclassical literary theory. Thus, we find John Dryden, who was one of the most influential British poets and literary theorists of the second half of the 17th century, argue in his work titled Grounds of Criticism in Tragedy, that literary criticism should be, and I quote, founded upon good sense and sound reason rather than on authority. Now let us come to the influence of capitalism on the emerging public sphere of the late 17th and 18th century. As noted earlier, the institutions that uh, made up the public sphere during this period, replaced the monarch's court as a site of social, political and economic discourse formation. And whereas the courts were uh, the domain of the aristocrats, the institutions of the public sphere were primarily the domain of the bourgeoisie, whom the growth of capitalism had pushed forward. Thus, the public sphere that emerged in Britain during the period under discussion was essentially a bourgeois public sphere and it was informed through and through this public sphere by the economic and political interests of the bourgeois class. Uh, but the discourses that took shape within this bourgeois public sphere were not merely limited to the economic and the political, rather it also included the cultural and the public sphere was also used by the bourgeois to shape a cultural worldview which was in sync with their economic and their political views. It was as part of this broader bourgeois cultural project that we see the development in Britain of the field of English literary studies and the associated field of literary theory. So from this general discussion of uh, context within which neoclassical literary theory emerged, let us now move to some uh, specific aspects of this literary theory. As I have explained, 
while discussing the etymology and the development of the term uh, literature within English language, engagement with literary texts was associated during the late 17th and 18th century with cultural taste, with cultural refinement. Possessing or reading literature signified a degree of cultural sophistication which was supposed to distinguish the new bourgeois from the peasants and the industrial laborers. Attempts to critically engage with literature was indeed perceived by the bourgeoisie as a mark of an elevated social status uh, that was earlier exclusively enjoyed by the aristocrats. And during this period, we therefore see the emergence of a literary theory that is deeply concerned with the issue of developing cultural refinement and with the issue of developing social sophistication. A clear instances of uh, this uh, is to be uh, found in uh, the 18th century journals like the Tatler, for instance, or the Spectator, where uh, people like uh, Richard Steele uh, and uh, Joseph Addison uh, were using these journals highly effectively to instruct the bourgeois readership on what literature to read in order to develop a cultural taste that would distinguish them as gentlemen. Now, it is important to note here that in uh, the matter of judging what is good in proper literature and uh, developing a refined cultural taste through it, the literary theorists of the bourgeois public sphere relied heavily upon the classical literary and theoretical texts. And this was primarily because the value of the classical texts were already well established. Uh, this means that the key classical texts that we have discussed in our previous lectures, uh, like for instance Aristotle's Poetics or Pseudolongenesis on the Sublime, formed a sort of template on which the new kind of English literary theory was scripted during the late 17th and 18th century. It is for this reason that the literary criticism that emerged during this period from the bourgeois public sphere is referred to as neoclassical literary criticism because it revisited uh, in such a significant way the classical uh, literary canons. Now, one of the chief ways uh, in which literary theorists of the bourgeois public sphere were using the classical texts was by treating them as repositories of stylistic decorum and literary rules and conventions. The works of Aristotle, for instance, or Longinus or Horace were being used to formulate a set of literary do's and don'ts, which could then be applied uh, either to produce new literary works which were good and proper or to judge existing literary works and to, and to see how well they were uh, fitted uh, to develop one's cultural taste and one's social refinement. Indeed, for the 18th century uh, British poet and theorist Alexander Pope, these rules which he could find in the classical texts went even beyond the issue of stylistic decorum. Because according to Pope, the literary conventions devised by the classical author were a reflection of the rules that underlined nature itself. So for a literary critic or an author, acquaintance with these classical rules were not simply a matter of cultural taste, but also a matter of truthful reflection of nature and of man's place within nature. Uh, so as Pope writes in his famous essay on man, and I quote, those rules of old discovered, not devised, are nature still, but nature methodized. And then uh, a few lines uh, later, 
we find Pope advising both the author and the critic, and I quote again, learn hence for ancient rules a just esteem, to copy nature is to copy them. It is however important to note that these rules and conventions which uh, the neoclassical theorists culled from the texts of their classical predecessors did not evoke an unquestioning admiration. Um, take for instance the rule of the three dramatic unities. Now this is a particular rule which enjoyed a great degree of popularity among the 17th and 18th century theorists, um, which uh, stated that any play in order to attain the elevated status of a classical Greek drama uh, needs to abide by three important things, three unities. Uh, the first is that it needs to have unity of place, uh, which means that it needs to confine its actions to a single location. Second is it needs to have unity of time and uh, resist any attempt to randomly jump forward or backward in time. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, it needs to have unity of action, where uh, the plot remains uncontaminated by any subplot that might uh, divert the audience from the main story, main focus. Now, uh, though many neoclassical theorists believed in the sanctity of these rules, which they could see uh, being abided by sort of uh, classical Greek tragedians, uh, there were also others who questioned uh, these rules by pitching uh, the plays of Shakespeare against uh, these rules. Because if you read uh, Shakespeare's tragedies, you'll see that uh, almost all of them uh, regularly violate uh, each of these three unities. Thus, uh, though on the one hand, we have someone like Pope who uh, insists that we learn uh, just esteem for the ancient rules, on the other hand, we have a text like uh, Dryden's uh, essay on criticism, for instance, where the matter of following rules and conventions of the classical authors is placed within the structure of a rational debate. So, it is not something that uh, is presented as, uh, you know, a set of rules that is written in stone. It becomes a matter of debate and discussion, at least in Dryden. And in many ways, uh, Dryden's text is perhaps more representative of the spirit of open debate that informed the bourgeois public sphere than Pope's admonitions um, to follow the rules laid down by the ancient. But in spite of uh, acknowledging this diversity, there is no denying the fact that an excessive concern with rules, with conventions and with stylistic decorum occupied neoclassical literary theory of uh, the late 17th and 18th century. And this concern would uh, remain strong till it will be displaced by the emergence of a radically new conceptualization of literature within the field of English uh, literary studies during the late 18th and early 19th century. And it is to this new conceptualization of literature that we will turn in our next lecture, where we will start with our discussion of Romanticism. Thank you. Mm -hmm.